Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar. I am Russell Plaska with Kansas Department of Agriculture. I serve as the Ag Business Development and Workforce Development Director here at KDA. We're very pleased tonight to be able to bring together some information for you tonight and hopefully answer some questions here at the KDA and as well as some of our partner agencies. We do get a lot of questions throughout the year on the H-2A program as well as the CDL, the commercial driver's license requirements for those H-2A workers as well. So this evening we hope to give you some great information to, to kind of be consistent in that messaging and allow you the best information so that you can get the job done in bringing home our products that our great state produces in agriculture. So a couple of housekeeping items we wanna go over first. Questions during the presentation, we do ask that you put those questions in the chat feature at the bottom. Dana Ladner here at the Kansas Department of Agriculture will be monitoring those questions throughout the evening. And we will be asking a few questions after each presenter, but the bulk of the questions will wait until the end and try to get to most all the questions. With that said, we will pre be providing follow-up. So if you do have questions, we will pass those questions on to the appropriate person. And we will be following up via email to those participants that had follow-up questions. Uh, the webinar will be recorded and it will be available on our website. Everyone that registered for the event, we will send that link via email after it's been uploaded and we'll send that link out to you. If you are with the media, we do ask that you identify yourself in the chat just in case there's any follow-up questions and so forth that we can connect with you if we haven't already. With that, I am going to ask Secretary of Agriculture, Mike Bean, to bring welcome to this evening's presentation. Secretary Bean. Hey, thank you, Russell. Uh, thanks all of you for uh, chiming in and, and listening and, and hopefully interacting. I also want to thank the presenters. Uh, I'm sure this is going to be a very helpful program. You know, the ag workforce is, is a priority uh, and we, we take it seriously here at the Department of Ag. So if there's a follow-up uh, that you want to do directly to, to Russell and I, uh, please reach out to us and, and let us know how we can help. But again, welcome and, and thank you, Russell. Thank you, Secretary Bean. With that, we're going to dive right into it. To start off with this evening, we have representatives from the uh, U.S. Custom Harvesters, the Operation Managers, Mandy Siren. And Mandy would like to bring welcome on behalf of the U.S. Custom Harvesters, plus tell a little bit about the U.S. Custom Harvesters and their role in this. So, Mandy? Thanks, Russell. Let me share my screen here real quick. So U.S. Custom Harvesters is a national organization. We were founded in 1983 in Texas. Uh, we moved to Hutchison, Kansas in the early 2000s, and now we're located between Pratt and Hutch. So it's kind of cool that a national organization is based here in Kansas. We are governed by a board of directors. I'm the only employee. I'm the operations manager. And we have around 650 members. And there's two types of members. We have harvester members that are custom harvesters crew owners from all across the United States. We have about 430 different custom harvesting crews in our organization. Um, anywhere from silage, grain, cotton, hay harvesters, they are a part of our group. Um, they can also have anywhere from five to 150 employees. So this is probably something I don't need to tell a lot of you, but it is hard to find American workers, especially for custom harvesters that leave home from anywhere from six to 10 months out of the year. So many of them do use the H-2A program, as you know. Uh, most of their H-2A workers are from Brazil and Mexico, South Africa. We, as an organization, the reason that we have a lot of members is that we provide industry knowledge, updates on the industry, such as road construction, because they do travel a lot. Um, probably most important DOT regulations that we have to follow. We lobby for changes in government and legislation in our favor. 
Um, on our website, we do provide a list of employees that are interested in working on a crew. We also have farmers call the office and if they're looking for a harvester, we email that information out to our members. So we kind of help them get jobs as well. Uh, we do also have a monthly magazine, like I said, just to keep just to keep our members updated on the industry. So that's a little bit about our harvester members. Uh, the second type of members that we have are our associate members. And our associate members are businesses that provide products or services to custom harvesters. So for example, um, custom RV companies, silage trailer companies, John Deere cloth, those are all associate members of our organization. Um, the reason that people become associate members is to advertise in our magazine, get out there directly to the people that are making those decisions. And they're also able to attend our annual convention. So we do have a couple events that our organization is a part of. Um, in April and May, right before harvest kind of starts, we help out organizing safety events for custom harvest crews to bring their whole crew to. And safety is a really big part of, of what we do, as you can imagine. Um, having that many employees and being on the road that much during the year, safety is definitely a priority. The other big event that we have is our annual convention, which is usually around the last weekend in January. So at that convention, we have a very large trade show. It's over 110,000 square feet, uh, various speakers. We have an auction. We all eat meals together. We have an awards banquet. Um, it's just a really good time to spend time with other custom harvest crews and meet each other. Uh, it's also a really good time to talk to those vendors, our associate members, and just share knowledge. For example, I know um, the John Deere engineers love the convention because they're talking to the harvest crew owners that run that equipment, like I said, eight, nine, 10 months out of the year. So they, they definitely form those relationships. Um, we're all kind of like a big family. I know I've got a lot of our members on the call right now. So if you're ever looking for a harvester or you are a harvester and you'd like to join, um, more than welcome just to take a look at our website, just Google US Custom Harvesters and we'll pop up. Um, we also, I also try to do, and I'm gonna try to do it this year. I started doing some Facebook Lives last year, just trying to show the different, what custom harvesting is all about and show the different types of harvest between silage and grain. So. Those are pretty cool to watch if you follow our page. Um, and the website's up right now, so take a look at it if you're interested. And I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have. Great, I covered everything, perfect. <laughs> thank you, Mandy, very much. And I really want to thank you for uh, taking time out of your anniversary day and evening. Mm -hmm. So. Happy anniversary and congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. With that, we were ready for our next speaker, uh, Dixie Cravens and Wendy Nzuza with the uh, Department of Commerce. Dixie is the Foreign Labor Cert Certification Manager and Wendy is a State Monitor Advocate. So uh, we invited those these folks on here tonight because a lot of people across the state may not know that the Department of Commerce also helps in the H-2A pro process. So we wanted to have Wendy and Dixie on this evening to provide some updates from their point of view, as well as to give some educational points about what kind of services they do offer. So, Wendy? Hi, everyone. I'm gonna share my screen here really quick. Um, so again, thank you, Russell. My name is Wendy Insunsa. I'm the State Monitor Advocate for Department of Commerce, and I'm going to do a quick overview of employment services in your local area that are free of cost. Um, so let me get there. Here you're seeing just a few local offices in the state of Kansas where um, if you're familiar with workforce centers, then you know that they offer job seekers um, free resources to find jobs. So this is where everyone's going, right, to look for employment opportunities. But they also offer employer services as well to find job seekers to fill their positions. Um, and again, it's all free of cost. So 
In the website, the Kansas Works website is where, again, job seekers or employers can come in and, um, and utilize to open up accounts and um, start looking, if you're an employer, start looking for candidates. Um, if you're an H-2A employer already, if by chance you're already using H-2A, then of course you probably already have an account going and maybe you've never utilized your account in Kansas Works, but assuming that no one's doing H-2A yet, um, there's a few options to get started with the workforce centers um, to get some of their services. If you go to their website, um, you'll see it says job seekers and employers. So you'd click on that employer button and here it'll give you a, you know, a few bullet points of what services are available for you. Um, the one I'm going to highlight is connecting with workforce center staff for advice and support. Um, truly take advantage of that if you haven't already or if you haven't done it in a long time because, you know, things are changing, especially after this year of COVID, a lot of things are going virtual. Um, and so they're able to, um, you know, really get to more people just by doing social media blasts or um, even utilizing this, this website. So you can go in there and create your own account. Um, and it'll also, you know, explain to you how to build a job posting or, you know, how to find resumes if you're trying to find someone. Now, the thing here is in Kansas, this is a little map of Kansas, you'll see all the different offices. Um, the ones with the stars are the ones that are full-time offices that are open from Monday to Friday. Um, the ones with the little diamonds are the ones that are open just part-time. Now, again, due to COVID, that's changed a bit. Some offices have closed down for a little bit and are only taking it by appoint taking customers appointment only. So you'd have to call your local office and see, you know, when they can, you know, meet with you or probably do everything over the phone or virtually like we're doing today um, so they can explain how they can help you find potential um, workers for you. Now, I will say, you know, as we all know, it is difficult to find to find people to employ, you know, to fill these positions. So I don't want to give a fake illusion that they're going to have all these candidates for you, but it's definitely a resource that I think is worth um, looking into and take, again, free of cost, let's take advantage of it. Um, so when you're on this website, to find your local office, you would go to contact us. And once you click there, it'll give you a list of all the local offices with their phone numbers. Or what you can also do is use the chat now button at the bottom. And the nice thing is it's a real person. It's not some automated system. You're messaging someone that's you know a trained workforce professional that can give you a little bit more information about how they can help you with finding you know, some potential um, candidates for your positions to fill. So to get your best results, these are just suggestions that I think um, will definitely help you get some, um, some extra assistance. When you, when you call them, you'll tell them I'm an employer, you know, and I'm needing some assistance and finding some people. Um, and, and you start to build that relationship or you meet with that business representative, you know, give them as much information as you can um, detailed information about the jobs, um, you know, explain what a strong candidate looks like to you. Don't assume that they're just going to know and don't, assume, don't think that just a job description is going to help them. The more you explain what you're wanting, the better they're going to explain that to maybe the staff that's helping the job seekers, um, you know, share maybe real life examples of what a day is going to look like. So it's clear expectations. So they also don't refer you someone that's going to waste your time that you're like, yeah, this person's not going to cut it. So yes, the more you can give, the better. Um, you know, maybe reach out to them at least a month, maybe two before um, you're gonna start looking for people because then if there's a virtual job fair, that's one big thing that's been happening again due to COVID, they're doing these virtual job fairs. So they're reaching more people. Um, and again, that's more candidates for you. Um, let them know, maybe they can plug you in there so you can be a part of that. Um, or they can tell you what they're doing at their local office to help, again, get you some of those people, um, those candidates. And um, see maybe if you can even speak to some of the local staff there. Um, prior to COVID, sometimes employers would come into a workforce center and just talk to the staff that are talking to the job seekers. And it's nice because then the staff, even though it's not, um, it's not a recruitment agency, but again, their, jo their job is to help people find employment, right? So they can ask you questions that job seekers ask them. And in a way, they're helping you look for people too. So just biggest thing is build that relationship 
Um, you know, and e even if you don't, maybe you get one person, two people at first, as time goes on, you know, word of mouth is going to help, you know, in that sense that they'll start to, there's going to be that awareness. Um, another thing is that there are going to be outreach workers here in the near future going out to farm workers to, um, you know, work with them and tell them about the resources that are available there. Who's to say we start to make those connections? Now, it's really early on right now, but it's in the works where they will be making those connections with farm workers so that um, hopefully then we they would have someone to refer you that may have that experience that you're looking for. Um, so just build that relationship, communicate what you're needing, and you know that business representative should be able to take care of you and and trying to give you some additional help. And again, best of all, I, can't, I keep saying it, it's, there's no cost. So why not, you know, invest that time. Um, now, if that's not going to work for you, and this is, you know, the H2A program, great program. This is where Dixie's going to share a little bit about that, the other options that you have. So Dixie, I'll, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Wendy. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to get to visit with you. Um, my role is the Foreign Labor Certification Manager, and so I am reviewing the H-2A, H2A applications that come in so that I can make sure there are no deficiencies. Um, our system has changed from when I first started, the applications would come directly to me. Now the agents or you, if you're filing yourself without an agent, are entering that information into our flag system, which is in Chicago. And I see those orders, I then review them and I place the job order on Kansas Works. Um, so far this year, we're as six months into our year because we start in October. Our fiscal year is a little different than sometimes the state's fiscal year. So we are in six months now and we have processed 274 applications at this point. That has resulted in 1,468 job openings. Now of that, 1468, 1,272 have already been certified applications. The remaining applications, which is 196, some of those were denied. Um, others have not been certified yet because we're still waiting on possibly a housing inspection or missing documentation that was not filed at the time of the application. And for those of you that don't know, I'll briefly go over what um, the H-2A program is. It is basically a temporary agricultural program which allows agricultural employers who anticipate a shortage of domestic workers to bring non-immigrant uh, foreign workers to the U.S. to perform agricultural labor or services of a temporary or seasonal nature. Employment is of a seasonal nature where it's tied to a certain time of a year by an event or a pattern, such as a short growing season, or there could be um, other things that have caused delays in the farming. There, there have been years where it has been extremely wet and you couldn't get in the fields or, um, unusual winters that have prevented from things happening on time. Um, employment is of a temporary nature when the employers needs to fill that position with temporary workers will exceed extraordinary circumstances and last no longer than one year. Now there are workers out there um, or I should say farmers and agents may uh, apply for them. I will say I have seen more self-service applications come in since we've gone to the flag system. Um, the cost of hiring is a lot on the farmer because they're paying the airfare to get the H-2A worker over here. 
And if that worker stays 50% of the time or longer, they, ha they have to reimburse them for their travel home. They are also providing housing for the workers to stay in and have to provide kitchens for them to prepare their meals, provide transportation for them to get their groceries and that type of thing. So there's a lot of expenses that we know um, you farmers incur when you're hiring these, these folks to come over and help. The, it has changed drastically in the years because the labor force is not as it used to be in the years past. A lot of the younger people are more into their cell phones and their tech games and those types of things. And they don't like doing the hard work that's cold or hot or dirty or, you know, the temperatures that change and vary so that people have had trouble finding extra workers. The numbers have continued to grow over the years. I have done this for a little over nine years in this particular office occupation here in Topeka. And when I first started in 2012, numbers were around 145. In 2019, we went up to 204 applications. Last year in 2020, we did 265. And as I've mentioned, right now we are at 274 applications and have six months to go. Now, granted, um, there'll be three months of this last six months that we don't get a lot of applications in, but I'll be very surprised if we don't go over 300 for our numbers this year. I want to give you my phone number in case any of you have questions and would like to call me. And my number is 785-291-3470. And I am located here in the Commerce Building and I will return your calls and try to answer any questions you may have. Do I have any questions at this time? We do. Okay. Yeah. Go I ahead, Dana. Oh, sorry, Russ. Uh, Dixie, we do. We have one um, each for you and Wendy, and Dixie will go with you. Okay. With that, you gave us some really good numbers at the start of your presentation with it on being able to have those positions filled. So how does that directly look um, for Kansas agriculture, those positive numbers, applications to those that have been placed? What do those numbers look like? The numbers that I gave for now with the, the 1,468 job openings, the certified number is 1,272. It'll be very rare if not all of those are filled or already filled. Great, and those are agriculture positions for it. So um, that's exciting for our sector. Some of them are custom harvesters, some higher. And I see another question here, how many uh, workers are requested in each application? That depends on the individual, what they're doing and how many they need. We get applications that only ask for one worker. We have some that only ask for two. I can tell you I have one out in the Hayes area and he's a custom harvester and he hires 83 people. So we have um, 11 travel units that we have to inspect to go with that. And when I say we go out and do housing inspections, we are making sure those are something you would want to live in yourself. They're, they have to provide them dishes, uh, towels, and that type of thing. They do provide their own meals. They, we have to verify that there's enough beds for the number of workers requested for each application. Um, there's other there's a whole nother area about housing inspections, but we have to know if it is um, ETA standards or if that falls under that OSHA because there's different requirements for when that house may have been built. 
So there's a lot of things the housing inspectors are looking for. Now this year, because of the pandemic, we have done some virtual uh, housing inspections. Many of these workers, we have done inspections before, so we already had in measurements, but when we don't, we have asked the employer to measure the room and then send us pictures with the number of beds that are in each room and how many there are so we can make sure that it is the right space, that they're not overcrowded, um, that they do have the linens and the stuff provided for them. So we've had to adapt to our conditions on how we have done that, but um, it has worked out very well. Well, good. For th thank you for that. And we did post your number in there that you gave us at 785-291-3470. So yes. we put that in the chat for folks. Uh, Wendy, I have a question for you. Um, curious with it, are there programs available that can assist in finding workers that may still be in the U.S., but in between jobs? Um, if they run well, when when the worker comes over with their visa, and I don't do anything with the visas myself, but um, the visa is for the amount of time that the job is scheduled to end. The farmers are required to uh, notify authorities if the job earns, ends early, and then that visa is temporarily pulled. So, <clears throat> They're tracking who comes and who leaves and that type of thing. And, and I don't do any part of that, so I can't go into a whole lot of detail on that. But I do get um, information when somebody has either left and no longer wanted to do the job, then um, I'm copied on that. But Chicago is made aware and then the, the right department contacts so that that visa is withdrawn and that individual has to go back. Okay, great, thank you on that. Um, Wendy, I, I don't know if you can help here on this next question. With it, sure. after we ask this question, then we'll roll to our next speaker with that. Um, we had a question from a participant as far as with the program and the Kansas Works uh, portion of that. The, the question is, are how many US workers have filled these positions uh, versus the H-2A workers. Wendy, do you have any comments on that piece? Well, I, I do. I, you know, the thing that, because I did see the, the question and comment, and I appreciate the honesty, because that's something that, you know, although I don't work um, for a workforce agency, I'm, I'm connected to them through departments, of course, and that's one of the goals is how do we bridge that gap? Now, Last 10 years, if someone's not getting any U.S. workers, the one thing I would, you know, I would want to know a little bit more about, and of course not now, but is what is the relationship between your local office? Because sometimes what is happening is the job is being posted in Kansas Works, um, but it's not like the frontline staff in any office get a ding or know that your position's been posted. So what ha it just goes into the virtual world. So locally, sometimes you can have a job posted there and the frontline staff may not know that it's actually there. And if they don't know, they're not telling their job seekers. So that's why I stress, you know, to, you know, if you're using the H2A program, it's a great program, keep doing that, but start, re and if you, you know, if it was two, three years ago that maybe you, you try to work with someone, again, that's what I would say, revisit, see who your business representative is and try to get to, you know, communicate with them and, hey, this is what I'm needing now. Is it going to be overnight? No. Um, you know, and as for how many U.S. workers, I don't have that data necessarily. Actually, I, I wonder if, Dixie, you might, but um, but I know it's not many because, again, there's that disconnect. It's because it's going through, um, for the H-2A program, it's going through the process. It's posted differently. So it's being posted, if you will, through the back end, not through the front end. So again, the people that are talking to the job seekers may not even know that your job is there. So you really have to talk to your local office and say, hey, you know, I'm doing the H-2A program, but 
or, you know, they should be your first point of contact in the sense, but I understand, like Dixie was saying, it's hard to find applicants that are wanting to do these jobs, but I wouldn't just say it's a one size fits all. I know there's some people out there that would, maybe it's one, two or three. And if that's all you're needing, that could save you a good amount of money. Now, if you're needing 10, 15, 30, you know, H2A is probably going to be more logical because I don't want to give fake promises, but it's all about, you know, at least reconnecting with your workforce center be very detailed about what you need and build that connection and, you know, keep working with them. And, you know, hopefully within the future, that's one big emphasis we're going to do is also working with the farm workers to see who they are and possibly referring them within the state. You know, if they're going to move to a different state before they move, hopefully our outreach workers can find them and possibly start referring them, you know, and keeping them in Kansas if it's someone that goes state to state, for example. So it's not a perfect thing, but it's something that we're working on for sure. Well, well, that's great. It sounds like this, this is Dixie. May I add to that? Um, the system has just changed, and now the job orders in Kansas Works are going to the nearest local workforce center near that employer. So they are changing the way we've done it as of about two weeks ago. So I think in the future, that is going to help correct that situation. Mm -hmm but still connect with your local office. Yes, yes. You have to make that in-person connection and let them know what you're needing, what you're looking for, so that they have, you know, so that they, again, still know. Because even if it's in the local office, that's great. It's going to help, but make that connection. I can't stress how important that is. Well, great. Sorry I talked over the top of you on that. But again, it sounds like communication is the key. And I know our producers statewide um, are, are very passionate about this and make sure that they get the word out, but maybe we need to reconnect on some of those relationships with it. Thank you too for your time. And with that, Russ, I'll go ahead and turn it back over to you. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, Wendy and Dixie. So we'll shift gears and no pun intended to uh, Brian Brunt with the uh, Department of Revenue to talk a little bit about the CDL program. I know that, again, this is another issue that some of our producers and custom harvesters struggle with each year and, and becomes frustrating in getting those workers on time into the United States and then getting through that licensing process. So Brian, could you walk us through some of those things and, and how we can be more consistent across the state? Uh, yes, I can. And thank you for having me here. Uh, this is a joy. Uh, first of all, uh, I have the, Jackie, are you on the line? Yes, I'm here. Hi. Right, there she is. I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn over to Jackie right now. Jackie's gonna go over the first part on the documentation. Mm -hmm as the individuals enter into our uh, Jackie. Hi, well, I just thought, I'd, you know, real quick, I know that we usually have a lot of um, issues when our H2As are coming in to try to apply for their CDL permits for the first time. And I kind of want to run through a little bit of um, what the requirements that they're going to need coming in. Um, the first thing we're going to need is their, their passport and then their visa. Um, the visa to us is going to show um, that they are a Kansas employer, that the, the person they are working for is a Kansas employer. That's one of our biggest things we got to watch out for is that the employer is from Kansas. Then uh, social security card, if they've received it yet. A lot of our H-2As do not have one yet when they come and see us. It is not required when they first come in and see us. We can assign, it's a block number that they are given in our system. We'll just put a note in there that this individual has not received their social security card yet. So that way, when they if they come back and they return next year and see us, then we know to ask them for it at that point in time. Then upon the first time they come in, we would also need their I-94s. We can print them at the office if you request, um, which isn't a problem. Uh, issue we run into sometimes is if they've already entered the US, they will not get another I-94 if they are staying or changing locations and whatnot. That would be an I-797 notice of action. So that would be the other form that they would be asking for versus the, the I-94, depending on when they came in to the United States and Kansas. Then for proofs of their address, what we usually use for proofs of address, we just need one proof of address and that is the letter from their employer. The letter from the employer just basically states, hey, this individual with his name is working for me 
at the person's um, business name and they are residing at this location. That is all we need for address. I know that there's been some disconnect along the way. It went from two addresses to one address. We need both. All we need is that letter of employment that states the um, applicant's name, the H2A's name, the business they are working for, and the, the address in which they're residing at. And that's what we would need from them. Once we take all their information, we will run it through a program we call SAVE. It's just um, verifying how long they can be here. And that's how we, um, the, at the, the date that we use to put on their permit and then they, later on their driver's license. Unfortunately, um, they have to bring all their documents each time they come in to see us. If it's the same day, we don't have to scan them in again, but if it's the next day, we have to scan everything in until we print that credential. So that's kind of a, a big thing. Um, now we are doing, most of our offices are doing appointments and with the H2As, it kind of works out really well with them um, because we can block off enough time because if you can tell, it takes a lot of time to gather that documentation, scan it all in, type the notes, get them started on their testing. So sometimes we can block off. It's not required, just highly recommended, but is not required. Um, all of our offices are open at this point in time. Just give them a call. Most of the offices only have one incoming telephone number. So that gets a little tricky trying to get a hold of the offices, but just be patient. You are more than welcome to walk into those offices and make the appointments at the front counter as well. We have a lot of people that do that also. We are allowing um, same day retesting. So let's say the individual comes in, fails their first written test. As long as they get at least a 70%, we will allow them to retest one more time for the written part in our office. Um, to my understanding uh, with Brian, he'll probably uh, follow up on this. Um, FMCSA is allowing us to waive the 14 day waiting period. That is when you get your permit, generally you're supposed to wait 14 days before you can actually do your physical skills testing with us. But to my understanding, that has been waived at this point in time due to COVID and all that wonderful jazz. But I think that's all I've got to say. So I'll turn it back to Brian, unless there's some more questions that he has me, needs me to answer. Thank you, Jackie. And does anyone have any questions for Jackie at this time? Can we get a hear that? <laughs> <laughs> One that came in that uh, asked, could we get a letter from the DOR that states what is required for a license application? Uh, some offices ask for different items uh, or state of employee. Is there uh, a, a letter or a website that you can provide us in the chat? Maybe Jack, you can put that in if there's something that we. Well, the, yeah, that, while that, Brian, yeah, yeah, while Brian's talking, I'll get the actual website link on our website, but Kent has covered this many times for a while, so if there is certain offices that are asking for different things, probably need to let um, Topeka know so that they can get in touch with that office or that regional manager over that office and let them know, or if you want to, you can reach out to me and I will find out which regional manager covers that office and I will reach out directly to that regional manager and they can take care of it. Um, that's something we, we did um, yes. last year. We worked pretty close with last year. Um, is yes. I will put, I'll go ahead and put my email address in here. You're more than welcome to get in touch with me and I will try to maneuver and, and get things straightened out. I will also put my phone number in there as well. Um, I do a lot of uh, driving so you can text me, you can email me, you can call me. Leave me a message. I will call you back. I had some issues with my phone a couple of weeks ago, but I'm back in back in working order now. So, but I will find that link and put my phone number and email address. Great, Jackie. Before you um, add that information to the chat, um, if you would just go back real quickly on um, one of our participants say that they missed it, that they that a uh, applicant can get a CDL without their social security number. If you could just briefly um, go back over. 
that information that you provided us? Yeah, when they come in and see us, it is not required on our end for them to have that social security number at that time. They will have to obviously get it later because there'll be taxes that come in. But when they come and see us, it is not required on our end. Great. We have a question here either for Jackie or for, for Brian for a regular license. Um, what about online testing for that? Is that an option? Good question. They are just released this week. Um, that we just talked about it Thursday last week. They actually have now online testing. Um, I'm gonna have to find it on our website. I don't know if it's on our website yet, but I will find that too. But you can do it from the luxury of your own home. I don't know if H2As can run. Well, yeah, they should be able to, but you can yes, go online. Can. Yeah, yes, you can, can go online. Good. They can, you go online. Um, you can take the test. There's a, a fee for the actual using the online service. You can take um, the general, any of the knowledge, general knowledge, air breaks, combination, any of that stuff. It is timed. Um, it gives you an hour time frame to take it. There is some security factors like it won't allow you to, to look away from the camera and so, so you're cheating. Um, it won't let you like obviously look down at your phone or go to different websites, but you can do this all from home. You do only get four chances per each test. The website will allow you to do more, but when you come into an office for us to print your permit, we will be able to log into the website, see it, and we're like, um, sorry, you, you actually took, you passed it on your fifth try. It has to be a, a pass within the four tries. I will hunt that down in, um, there because I don't know if our, it's that one's actually posted on our website yet, but I will get that for you while Brian's speaking. Um, also, go ahead, go ahead. I think they said that English is already there now, Spanish should be next week. I see yes. that. Also. Great, we'll let you go ahead, Brian, and then we'll circle back for more questions. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> yep, I will get on that. Oh, there's the link. Hi, David. There <laughs> yeah, there's David. Hey, David. All right, our boss. All right, great. The, the thing I want to share with you is that as I sit here and listen to all, uh, everything that uh, the agricultural family is trying to do, I am just elated to have, to be here to talk with you all and do what all we can on the CDL side of the house to help you all become successful. Now, uh, as Jake, as Jackie stated, what we're doing, uh, Jackie, we also can pass this alone at our meeting tomorrow at uh, 10 o'clock and ensure that all the regional managers understand what was passed this evening. That's one thing. Uh, the second thing I wanna talk about on my side of the house is that helping you all the best I can. We have a team now that we haven't had before. So now we can literally go out if the vineyard is large enough, we can come out and actually proxy test there and have the individuals uh, uh, vice coming down and, and I should say in a nice way, mogging down the actual DMVs, we can, we have a team now that actually can come out to the locations or if we have a vineyard where we can have everyone meet at and actually administer tests there at that time. So that there can help, uh, tr you know, tremendously in the long run. Um, also, you know, we are here to ensure that, you know, these gentlemen actually put the safest driver out there on the road and we wanna make sure that uh, we're just not rushing through the process. So I was saying that uh, Jackie took it right to the next level. We're now moving forward to where what happened in the past, we're, we're no longer doing that. We have a brand new uh, a regime. We have a brand new uh, uh, program now that's gonna make it more easier and beneficial uh, for the uh, employer as he get the uh, individual, the employees in uh, to actually get things done quicker. So this is what we're trying to do. And, and let me give you my number right now as the state coordinator. My number is 785-213-9157. Uh, you can reach me at any time uh, on that number. Uh, please reach out to me. And uh, uh, if you're having some issues, uh, please let me know. Uh, testing, yeah, if we're having trouble uh, scheduling tests, uh, we have a direct uh, CDL line 
in Wichita that you can call, and that's 785 um, 940-1353. That's the direct CDL line you can call to get scheduling if you're in that area, anywhere in that area. But we here, we can help in any area. Just let us know what we can do to make this transition easier and smoother as we move forward. We're just here to help. And I'm so happy to be a part of this because I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. I'm an Aggie myself, so it's okay. Let's do it. Thank you. Great, Brian. It's so super that you just talked about the ease and um, being beneficial to agriculture with that. I have a couple questions and uh, from the chat and something that was submitted as well. Um, with the electronic age, you know, what forms can be submitted or shown on the spot on an electronic device, such as a smartphone, tablet, et cetera? Yes, what do we yes. have there for, for that piece of technology and where we're, where we're headed with this? We have in the past, and I'm sure we still do it now because I've I've done it yesterday, matter of fact. Uh, individual comes and they have their, perhaps their electric, electric bill or something that was emailed to them and they didn't bring it in to them. There are times where they can actually just, uh, can I email this to you? Yes, we we'll take it and we send them to our Kador website and we're printed off at that time. Uh, but uh, those are the little things that actually popped up where people, ooh, I forgot proof of residence or, ooh, I forgot this. Yes, we, we have done that in the past. Well, great. Another question that we had um, when Jackie was speaking, uh, one of our participants wanted to know if they can renew licenses for two years from the last expiration date. Oh, two years. Uh, I know we have been doing it because uh, usually, and this is what's happening in the happened in the past. An individual come, he works, an individual leave, and his license had didn't really expire at that time, but it went elapsed all the way over and it expired just before he got back here. All right. So at that time, it hasn't really been expired, you know, a whole year. So we work with them in that area. Uh, Jackie, have you done that in the past up there in Hayes? Sorry, I would try that one more time. It's like um, if it's been over like two years, uh, right. H2O right. coming back over, we have been. Yeah. Um, right. Generally speaking, it's usually been a year. If it hasn't been, if it's more than a year, year, generally speaking, we're supposed to do all that. We've actually been doing it where it's up to two years because of COVID and them not being able to come over last year and, and all that wonderful jazz. So we've been been stretching to two years. Um, we don't want to go much over two years. Like I think I did two years one month one time, and but they called me. I tell them, I said, if it gets to be that sticky, call me so I can rationalize it in my head. But we tried to two year mark of, of not making him retest again if it's been very close to two years. Yes. Great. Thank you on that. Another question that we had come in is, is there a fee to change a Mexican CDL? to an American CDL. <laughs> I'm sorry for laughing. Uh, these are, uh, it's, it's, it's basically the same fee. It's like an individual coming in from Colorado to Kansas City or Colorado to Kansas or Nebraska to Kansas. It's the same transfer of fees uh, and nothing really swayed a uh, change in that vineyard, no. Uh, you still get the $8 for the photo. And if, they, if they're transferring over a CDL license, we verify and then we make sure the documentation is right and we transfer that over as we would if the individual is getting enrolled. So yes, there are fees. Great. Um, a, a question that comes up and like I say, the, the participants you know, have a lot of great questions with this. Uh, one that I really found exciting was, um, could those that are applying for a CDL take the online test in their home country before traveling over? That I don't, I'm saying no at this point, but that I'm not sure of. Jackie, are you hearing anything about that in their home? I, that was a question we did not ask last week. So I am oh, not right. sure if there is a security issue with being across um, yes. the ocean, the sea. I yes. would have to ask, we'll ask Ken about that tomorrow. Yes, does the right. There, might, the, there might be a security thing. Exactly. At this time, I would say no, Dana. Got it. Um, we had a question on the number that you gave me for the, or gave us for the Wichita CDL. You started out with a 785 um, number for 
the area code is that 785 or is that a 6204 the Wichita oh, no, no. I'm sorry I'm sorry it's 785 and it's 940 okay 1353 so the Wichita CDL direct line 785 940-1353. Yes, ma'am. Perfect. That's great. And I see where Jackie has posted her contact information in there. With that, um, Russ, as I'm turning this back over to you, thank you to Brian and Jackie with that. And Brian, um, Jackie, we had someone ask about your uh, actual job title with this. So if you want to put that in the chat as well, that would be great. Um, and then Brian, uh, they wanted to know, one of our media folks that are logged in, if they can publish your number or if they have another way that you would like um, contact information to be put into you. And you can uh, let me know on that and we can get that information out. Oh, that, that sounds like a Pepsi right there. I don't know. <laughs> sure. By all means, post it up. Whatever we can do to help, please, by all means, post that uh, put it on the media, get it out there to our uh, agricultural employers and everyone, get it out there, please. This, we wanna, this, this new regime, we wanna make sure that we reach out and do all we can to help you all in any manner we can, and yet put out excellent drivers and get our products to where they have to get. So we appreciate that. Yeah, by all means, please. And anything else I can do, Russ, and anyone, whatever, whatever we can do, please do not hesitate to call us. We have a whole new direction we go in here and we want to do the right thing and help everyone. I do want to add something. I did try to find on our website the requirements for H2As with all our documentation. I did not find it on our website. So I'm going to get with um, uh, Kent and Skyla and see if we can put something together and either put it on our website or yes. have it submitted to um, Department of Ag for um, you guys to distribute it out. Um, but I will work on that tomorrow. So for everyone who's on here. And, and one more thing, Ms. Dana, just so you know, uh, uh, Jackie does an awesome job on the whole Western end of the state of Kansas. And we come and help her whenever she needs help out there. And of course the other Eastern side, whatever we can do there. But for the most part, she's a busy woman and she <laughs> makes it, she reaches out and touches everyone she can. So I think that's an awesome thing she does out there. I wanna commend her on that and let her know I do not take what she actually uh, do for granted. So thank you all so much. Yep, thank you guys. Let's take this enthusiasm to our next speaker. Sounds great. With that enthusiasm, I know a producer that, that's on here, when, when things go well for him, he likes to deliver fudge to certain people as well. So maybe he can provide some fudge for our revenue folks again, maybe. Anyway, our next speaker, our final speaker, and I know we're bumping up to that eight o'clock hour, but we've had some great discussion that's gonna continue with Michael Marsh. Michael is with the National Council of Agricultural Employers. So we're very happy to have Michael. I appreciate you coming on to give us an update of where we're at with the Farm Worker Modernization Act and any other insight you can give us on some possible changes to that H-2A program, Michael. You bet, happy to do it. And uh, good evening, everybody from uh, just across the river from Washington, DC, actually in the mornings, I can look out my kitchen window and I can see the nation's capital and there's nothing smoking or anything going on out of, over the capital these days. So actually it's pretty calm. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we'll jump into uh, a little bit of discussion on what's going on with uh, H2A and the Farm Workforce Modernization Act. I'll get here to the start and we'll, get going. Well, as uh, some of you may already know, NCA is, a, is the National Trade Association that focuses exclusively on the policy concerns of, of agricultural employers, and it's from the employer's viewpoint. We are the tip of the spear here, here in Washington, D.C., uh, but I originally hail from the great state of Wyoming, uh, and uh, I, I actually, I miss, I miss uh, the, the wide open spaces, and, and uh, actually, I spent a good deal of time in Kansas. Actually, when I was at the University of Wyoming, I raced in Lawrence a couple of times because I was with, on the track team. So, uh, but let's look a little bit at the numbers because the numbers are driving a lot of what we're gonna, what we see going on in agricultural labor. And the 2017 Census of Agriculture indicates there are about 2.4 million uh, ag workers uh, in the United States that were hired ag workers as of 2017 and about 200,000 of those ag workers are H-2A workers. 
So, and we also know from the National Ag Worker Survey that is done by the Department of Labor that about half of those domestic workers are unauthorized. And, and hence you have a real issue with re regard to some of the ag labor workforce. And of course, that's part of the initiative for uh, the Farm Workforce Modernization Act. And that act, uh, uh, which recently passed, once again, it has three titles. Uh, it is the, only the second house supported passage since 1986. And we passed a very similar bill back in 2019, in, in December of 2019, as a matter of fact. Uh, but we've always been able to get something through the Senate. So it was, it's, we've, we're, we were thrilled to get something through uh, the, uh, uh, the House of Representatives, but then of course COVID hit. And, and so we had to see whether or not we could bring this uh, bill back up in, in the 117th Congress. And it, and it did, and it has passed the House of Representatives. And on a bipartisan basis, we had a number of Republicans joining with us as well, about 30 Republicans joined with the Democrats in, in passing that uh, legislation. But this was a bill that was negotiated between agriculture and the United Farm Workers. And it was driven primarily by the House Judiciary Subcommittee Chair Zoe Lofgren. Uh, but it, uh, I think from the, the union standpoint, they recognized that this was really the high water mark in the, uh, for the unions in this negotiation, because uh, even though we passed the bill in the Senate, uh, we, uh, excuse me, in the House, we still have to go through the Senate. Well, uh, the Farm Workforce Modernization Act, the title, first title is Legalization for Existing Ag Workers. Title II is Improving the H-2A uh, Program. And then Title III uh, discusses Mandatory Verify, which would be a part of this legislation. Well, uh, I gotta move my uh, screen here just a little bit. Well, under the Title I, the Earned Legalization for Certified Ag Workers, the applicants must show that they've worked for at least 180 days of ag employment in the past two years. And they can get a five-year renewable visa uh, that, uh, that, they can, uh, that they can renew, provided that they continue to work for at least 100 days in agriculture each year. So we're not almost overnight gonna lose our workforce. Uh, experience, uh, but, uh, but if they also have agriculture experience, but they're not eligible yet, they could still apply as an H-2A under this uh, uh, legislation that passed in the House. Now, again, I mentioned this passed in the House. I'm expecting some changes, actually working on some changes in the Senate, uh, but it did pass it this way in the House. Uh, and uh, continuing on, then if I can move my I got these, I got to move these screens out, out of my wording. Otherwise, I don't know what I'm talking about. So uh, under the earned legalization, they have an option for permanent residence status as well. They have to pay a thousand dollar fine and do one of the following. Uh, they have to, the, the individual would have had to work for at least 10 years in agriculture before enactment. And then they must work an additional four years before they can actually apply uh, for that permanent residence status and pay that thousand dollar fine or the individual has worked less than 10 years in agriculture, then they must work for an additional eight years in ag before they can uh, being eligible to apply for that legal permanent resident status. Well, improving the H-2A program, and, and believe me, I believe that this program needs some serious work and needs some serious improvement. And that's a, a big part of the reason that we supported moving this through the process in the House of Representatives, but also why we're looking for some changes in the Senate. Uh, one of the things that, uh, one of the ideas for improving this h trade program through the House legislation is we'd have a single portal for filing. So you would file your application, it would go through a single filing process. Uh, so you, it would go to DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Labor, it would go to the State Workforce Agency, Dixie would end up with it. Uh, it would reduce the time for the application. Uh, they estimate between 75 to 60 days. Actually, we would put that in statute, so it would have to meet that 60 day limitation. And then you can also have a single petition for staggered needs. Let's say that at early part of the season, you have a need for, for 10 workers. And then later in the season, you have a need for another 30 workers. Well, today you have to file two different petitions in order to get those, uh, those two groups of workers, the 10 and the 20 to have the 30 that you're gonna need by harvest season. But under this, you'd be able to file a single petition, but just stagger their entry uh, so uh, it wouldn't cost you quite so much either. And then, of course, streamline the recruiting. And we've already got this because ads are placed online. Uh, and, uh, and But this would, of course, uh, take that out of the regulatory process and put it in statute. So it would take another act of Congress to essentially reverse that. There was a question that was asked earlier 
that I, I kind of fits into this, uh, but how many US workers actually filled H-2A jobs? And we got this question last spring uh, during COVID as we had a number of members of Congress. Uh, we had some of the more conservative members of the, of the Senate uh, actually uh, uh, asked President Trump to eliminate the H-2B program. And we had some uh, cons members of the Freedom Caucus also ask uh, the, uh, the president to eliminate the H-2A program because with all of the COVID and all the unemployed American workers, they were certain that we'd have people clamoring for these jobs out on the farm and come, wanting to come to work on the farm uh, be, because, uh, 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 because they had nothing else to do. Well, so we, we surveyed all, all 50 of the state workforce agencies across the country, and we got responses back from 26, and there were about 275,000 or so jobs that were certified last year by the Department of Labor. And out of that 275,000 for a three for a period of time from March 1st of, 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 of uh, 2020 until May 15th of 2020, we had a total of 337 domestic workers apply for those uh, 275,000 jobs. So clearly uh, we have a need for the H2A program and, and uh, I'm glad we still have it. Uh, and uh, I'm glad President Trump did not uh, uh, pay heed uh, to the calls to eliminate the program. Well, uh, improving the H-2A program, we're going to talk about wages here a little more, uh, but uh, they want to, uh, uh, this, this legislation would reform the wages, hopefully make them more predictable, more granular, uh, actually taking it down to the job. Uh, they would also limit wage fluctuations, and in, in 2022, provided this legislation would pass and get signed by uh, President Biden this year out of the Senate, and then they get into a conference, they have to work out their differences, and then, uh, and then they move it off to the President's desk after it goes back to the Senate and the House for uh, concurrence. But if they are, it would have a one-year wage freeze uh, uh, associated with this, and that would occur in 2022. And then from 2022 to 2030, you'd essentially have bumpers on the wages. It couldn't increase more than three, uh, three and a quarter percent, uh, and it couldn't go down more than one and a half percent. And heck, in Kansas in last year, uh, your, your increase is actually 6%. So it could actually, and hopefully would save uh, uh, producers some money. And then on 2030, in 2030, a new method would be developed with the Department of Labor, Secretary of the Department of Labor and the Secretary of uh, uh, the Department of Agriculture working on a new methodology uh, for, uh, for determination of wages under the program. Well, uh, there's still some more because uh, underneath this uh, uh, legislation also, mid-contract wage increases would go away. And I kind of support that because if you're in the middle of a contract with somebody and you've signed a contract with somebody, I'm going to pay you $15 an hour or whatever it might be. And, uh, and you get to a certain point in the contract and all of a sudden the Department of Labor says, well, wait a minute, we've got a new adverse effect wage rate. You're going to have to increase that now and pay somebody $15.50 an hour. That's crazy. You've already, you've already costed out your business. You've already put it out there. And, and I call this principle the what would Judge Judy do? She keeps you within those four con uh, corners of that contract. And that's getting us back to where you ought to be because once you enter into a contract, you ought to be stuck with it. That's uh, both sides. Uh, it would also, the legislation would also reduce some housing costs. It would preserve an existing housing with another $1 billion in grant monies that would be available to retrofit that existing housing. It would also incentivize new housing through grants to the US SBA. And it would also lower housing uh, with 521 rental assistance. This would actually be money coming out of the federal government to help the uh, farmers and ranchers who utilize the program uh, help pay for the housing, because this is not an inexpensive thing to get into, I got to tell you. Um, you uh, it would also hope to reduce the need for litigation, even though it would expand MISPA, the Migrant and Seasonal Ag Worker Protection Act, uh, to H-2A workers. There would be a required mediation, not binding mandatory mediation, but there would be required mediation, which would hopefully keep, keep some of the lawyers out of this. Uh, I hope there are no lawyers on the, uh, on the call, but uh, sorry, I'm, I'm not in, in the business of making money. And also underneath this program, it would provide year round labor with up to 40,000 green cards per year uh, available for ag workers. And an H-2A could apply for that green, year, a green card again after 10 years of ag labor in the United States. So uh, that may be an opportunity for them. 
And then also very importantly, and this is, I used to run the Dairy Trade Association out in California for uh, quite a period, about 15 years or so. Uh, but importantly, they would also provide temporary three-year visas for dairy and livestock. I mean, some of those year round jobs, because this is a, it, this, this program is a temporary uh, uh, a program. And, and usually most of those contracts are limited to, to 10 months. You can go under up to a year under, under statute, but the Department of Labor has somehow determined that a uh, year is only 10 months long. I, how they got there, I don't know. Well, one of the other things uh, uh, with this program is it would mandate E-Verify. It'll only be for agriculture. There would be a structured phase in of E-Verify. E uh, and then there would also be a guaranteed due process for authorized workers incorrectly rejected by the system. Uh, so, so now, what are our next steps? Uh, because this is important because we've got the bill out of the house. Now we're going on to the Senate and we need 60 votes, of course, to pass anything out of the Senate. I know Chuck Schumer's trying to get some additional uh, leeway there with the uh, parliamentarian, but I don't think he's gonna get on this kind of a bill. Uh, but we need a more employer friendly version. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier in my remarks, the House bill was the high water mark for the, uh, for the unions. We need a high water mark for employers and that's what we need to get out of the Senate and we're gonna need your help. We're gonna need Kansans help in getting this done. Uh, uh, Michael Bennett, a Democrat out of Colorado, and uh, Mike Crapo, a Republican out of Idaho, have indicated that they will jointly be introducing uh, legislation that we'll get an opportunity to work on and hopefully fashion that more employer-friendly version. And here's where I need your help. Because as we're working on this and we're getting together, I mentioned uh, we're going to need 60 votes to pass this. And I'm kind of excited because at the last time you had statutory change, the H-2A program goes back to 1986. We can't wait another 35 years uh, to have some changes to this program. So I'm gonna, we're gonna be reaching out to folks, asking to call uh, Mr. Moran, asking you to call Mr. Marshall and see if they can give us some, some help and also maybe some leverage as we're trying to, to get a better bill for employers. Well, how did we get here? And I'm just gonna, this, this kind of leads into some comments about uh, about uh, H2A, but also leads into comments, some comments about the adverse effect wage rate, which in my opinion, I think Sonny Perdue had it exactly right when he called it the perverse wage rate, uh, because that's exactly what it is, because it is not reflective, in my opinion, of the, uh, of the actual uh, uh, wage uh, that is being paid out in the marketplace today. But all this started back in 1952, and you, then in 1986, you had the Immigration Reform Control Act, H-2A regulations came out in 1987. We had some changes between different administrations. And then in July of 2019, President Trump uh, proposed rulemaking on this. And we filed our comments back in September. But you know what? It didn't go very far uh, because we were stuck waiting and waiting and waiting for the Trump DOL to issue these new, this new rulemaking because the proposed rule was 489 pages long. And, and we're waiting for this rule to come out because we needed to get it out before we had potentially a change in administration. And, and we were hoping also that we would get some more employer friendly uh, 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 eyes on this legislation and this regulation uh, from the Trump uh, White House. So I've been trying to get, we've been trying to get rid of this adverse effect wage rate for some time. So I filed another petition with Secretary Scalia saying if there is no adverse effect on the domestic workforce, as a result of the, the, the fact that you're employing these h 2 workers, you have no ad need for an adverse effect wage rate, so let's get rid of it, right? I mean, if you're not having an adverse effect, why would you have the wage rate? Wage rate? It makes no sense at all. But there was another reason that I was trying, I did that, we did that at NC, was we were trying to push the administration to get out that new rule so we could get working with that new rule. Um, at the same time, I filed comments uh, with the Office of Management and Budget on the USDA's Farm Labor Survey, uh, raising some concerns that we had experienced with the Farm Labor Survey, which is actually used to derive those wages you pay on the adverse effect wage rate. And so we filed those, uh, uh, those, those comments with the uh, USDA and unbeknownst to us, Apparently, USDA had a mind to, to kind of do the same thing and stop publishing the, the Farm Labor Survey. And uh, uh, they actually notified the Department of Labor, who has a contract uh, with the USDA to go ahead and do that Farm Labor Survey on the 14th of September. And we found that out during court filings. We're going to talk about some of this litigation as well. Well, in, in, on the 30th of September, USDA actually canceled that farm labor survey, and then UFW, the United Farm Workers, uh, went to court in Fresno, and they got a, an injunction against USDA from canceling the survey. So, you know, you got to think about that, because if UFW doesn't represent 
any of these H2A workers, where was their dog in this fight? Unless instead they really think that instead of having an adverse effect on the domestic workforce, employment of these H2A workers because of the wage that's involved actually has a beneficial effect on the domestic workforce. And that's exactly what we believe is occurring. Uh, and that's why UFW brought this suit. Well, uh, finally, we had DOL published a new rule on the wage part, uh, just on the wage piece on, on the 5th of November, and then D and DOL issued the final H2A rule, uh, and which went to IRA, uh, at the Office of Information Regulatory uh, Affairs at the White House. On, uh, that's the balance of the rule went to the White House on the 24th of November. Well, on the 30th of November, UFW sued again against this new Department of Labor AWER methodology, which would have done away with the utility of the Farm Labor Survey for determining what that adverse effect wage rate is. Well, under the H-2A Temporary Ag Labor Program, employers are required to pay the higher of the state or the federal minimum wage, the collectively bargained rate, the prevailing wage, or the adverse effect rate, the wage rate. So they've got to pay the highest of whatever that is. And historically, that's, that's been, in most states, most jurisdictions, the adverse effect wage rate. But when we, this is where we start getting into some of those challenges with what the Farm Labor Survey is telling us. Because when we look at these annual changes between the employment and cost index looking at and, and jobs across the entire economy, and we compare that to the wages that are being reported on the farm labor survey, we see a dramatic difference. And of course, once you start compounding those year after year after year, you look at some of these areas where you've had a cumulative change since 2015 of almost 27% in that wage rate in, in the mountain region. To, where the employment cost index is less than 11. Something is not working here. Something is not working here. And we're gonna talk about that in just a second. Well, there, why do you have an A-word? As I mentioned, the requirement to pay it is to avoid any adverse effect on the domestic workforce. And when you only have 337 workers even applying for 275,000 jobs, how adverse an effect are you having on that workforce? I'd say none. But USDA has historically contracted, as mentioned that with the USDA Department of Labor to perform that survey. So what's the problem? Well, NAST does a great job. And when DOL uses it as a wage though, unfortunately, it's, we find that this is really disconnected from the actual wages that are paid by farmers and ranchers across the United States. Unfortunately, in the surveys, H-2A wages are included in the survey to establish a wage for the H-2A workers. So you have an echo effect. Now, I, I'm not an economist. I, 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 my, my first degree is in history, and then I went to law school, and I went back, and I got another degree in accounting, and I practiced fraud investigation and forensic accounting and public accounting for a number of years. Uh, and I'm not an economist because I've got far too much personality, right? Yeah, okay. So, but but also included here within some of that data, I'm sure that is showing up at the USDA are piece rates over time for those states that are requiring it now, as well as bonuses. And then they average everything together. So let's say that you had a worker on your, on your farm that had gone to Kansas State, has a degree in precision agriculture, and uh, uh, is uh, knocking down 120,000 a year. Let, let's just say, say for instance, and uh, so they're, uh, they're making uh, uh, whatever it is at an hourly rate for the 120,000, 60 bucks or whatever it is, is an hour. And then you've got one other worker that's, that, that's an H2A worker and you're paying that person 15 bucks an hour. Now you, wait, you average those two wages together and guess what? That becomes your new adverse effect wage rate for the next year because you're averaging all of these wages together and it makes no sense. It makes no sense. This is the survey document. I'm gonna share this with you. And you might've seen it come into your mailbox. This is one from last April. And there's a couple of professors, one from Clemson University, another one with Michigan State, who have written me a nice white paper actually going through this and explaining exactly what the problems are with, this ad, with the adverse effect wage rate and the farm labor survey. They're very concerned. And this is where the problems start to arise. So in, when you look at this part of the survey, you're supposed to enter the worker code. Well, okay, now are they an agriculture equipment operator? Are they a field hand? Uh, what are they doing? Are they a sheep herder? Are they uh, working with livestock? What are they doing on the farm? And how many, then you go to number of paid workers for this week, because you're only looking at one week, the total hours worked in that week, the total base hours and how many overtime hours. Okay, so then you get to total gross wages. Okay, so you, that's kind of just arithmetic. You go across, the, across it like that. But, but then you're supposed to break out from that gross wage, 
your base wages, the bonus wages, and the overtime wages. So, so let's say that you don't break out that Christmas bonus you gave to your workers. Let's say that you had somebody working on a piece rate and you didn't break those out either. You just put them in gross wages because you know what? It's the easiest thing to do and you got something else to do and you need to get this survey off your desk and, and, and yet that pops in there too. Well, you know, that's where some of the errors are coming into the USDA without a doubt, without a doubt. And again, USDA does a great job, but if you have garbage coming in on the survey, you're gonna have garbage coming out of the survey. And here's that other issue. Uh, in, during the year, did you, uh, did you employ H-2A workers? You checked yes, no, I don't know. When I asked USDA and NAS, I said, well, what do you do with these surveys when they come back with the, 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 the farmer, the ranchers checked yes, do you, dis, do you discard that survey? And they say, no, we include it. And we include the data from it too. And I said, well, how are you avoiding an echo effect? He said, they, oh, don't worry. It's only about 5% of a report that they're using H2A workers. Well, now you've got a five, at least a 5% error and it's not in the farmer's favor that this error is occurring. This has got to get straightened out, which you can see, this is exactly why UFW loves this uh, because it sticks, it sticks the farmer with trying to figure out exactly uh, how, how they're going to come up with the additional revenue to pay for these wages. Well, as I mentioned, of course, uh, this has spawned uh, uh, litigation, uh, UFW versus USDA, that was the first case. And then UFW turned around and they sued the Department of Labor. And it was interesting to me reading their arguments because you know, as, I, as I mentioned, I, I, I've been a CPA, I've, I've, I've done, uh, and I went to a small school in Wyoming where they actually taught arithmetic, uh, but uh, uh, they said you slashed wages. So if last year in, in, in uh, Kansas, uh, underneath the H2A program, you were having to pay $14.99 an hour. And then by, by the next time you had to pay $14.99 an hour, how does $14.99 not equal $14.99? How's that a reduction in wages? I don't get that. I don't get it. And I'm sure you don't either because $14.99 equals $14.99. It doesn't equal something less. Well, also the adverse effect. Is there any adverse effect here? Obviously not. But the adverse effect wage rate, as mentioned, it's based on the farm labor survey. It's a flawed survey, and it is disconnected from the marketplace for agricultural wages. And that is a shame. It's got to be changed. Well, a little update, um, uh, the Trump rule, we actually did have it uh, come out on the, I believe it was the 16th of January in pre-publication uh, form, maybe it was the 15th. Uh, and then it was withdrawn on inauguration day uh, uh, by the Trump administration. So we never really did get to see that. Now, we're going to see that we're going to see that rule at some point. But now it's going to be the Biden rule uh, because the uh, because the rulemaking had been completed, uh, the Biden administration under new uh, Labor Secretary Marty Walsh uh, is going to be publishing that uh, that new uh, rulemaking uh, at some point, probably uh, I'm guessing probably still sometime this spring. Um, a couple of things to really watch here, uh, and particularly with, with regard to harvesting, is gonna, are gonna be your truck driving issues as well as your ag equipment operator issues. Um, I've, I've tried to make the argument, I think we need to continue to make it, that uh, the, just because you, you separate the, uh, the wheat kernel from the shaft doesn't mean that, uh, 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 doesn't mean that that harvest is complete because it's not complete until you get that, that crop, that wheat into the elevator, is it? Or, or let's say that you're in an orange orchard in, in Florida or an apple orchard in, in Washington state. Once you pick that apple or that orange from the tree, that harvest isn't complete until you've got it to the packing shed or you got it to the, 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 the plant that's gonna make it into juice. Harvest is not complete until you actually can put that crop in the channel for where it can be marketed. And this is something we're gonna to have to work on. And this is maybe an opportunity for us to change some of this legislation in the Senate so we can actually get a better bill out of the Senate. Well, and now to just close, I, you know, I, really, I, I really appreciate uh, being invited to, to, to visit with you this evening. I wanna thank you guys for being here, for doing what you do, for your professionalism and your commitment to ethical behavior for doing the hard work during tough, tough times and difficult circumstances. We've come through COVID, it's still with, it, 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 with us, it's gonna be with us uh, for a period of time yet. Uh, you guys have navigated through it, you did a great job. Thank you so much uh, for doing uh, so, such a good job. Thank you for being humble 
in facing those tough times with grit and determination. And thank you for protecting America. Uh, because if we don't have food, if we don't have food security, we have no national security. And I want to thank you for doing your part. Thank you so much. And thank you for the opportunity. I'm ready to answer any questions that you might have. Wow, Michael, that was terrific information. And thank you. There's your contact information still on the screen. Um, with that, I do have one question that was kind of towards the beginning of your presentation about um, ag experience and uh, applying for, for different things with the legal status. Um, would those that are applying be able to count their past years of work in ag experience to apply towards that eight years of ag employment for the legal status? If they can yes. document that work. Yes, and they, they, have to, they have to be able to document it too. Great, great, great. Um, another question that I have um, with this, and you, you talked a lot about what's going on in DC with it. Is there something else in the bill that might be keeping senators from passing this? Yes, it has to do with immigration. <laughs> that's that's one of those third rails in Washington D.C. It's uh, it's one of those things that you don't touch. That it, it, it keep, makes people very very nervous. And you know, to tell you the truth, I was on a call this uh, past week with the uh, National Security Council as well as the State Department, uh, and we were talking about some of the issues uh, at, at, that are occurring at the at the border. I, I might remember in the previous administration uh, uh, when Jeff Sessions was the Attorney General. Uh, Attorney General Sessions actually kind of dismantled some of that asylum uh, uh, structure for reviewing those asylum cases at the border for people that were trying to cross. And at the same time, the administration, the Trump administration said, okay, you're gonna stay on the other side of the border. And one of the other things that did occur in those Northern Triangle countries of El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras is that they, um, the, the federal foreign aid that was going there was diminished significantly. So, so uh, economic, uh, well, security issues and economic issues for infrastructure, you weren't able necessarily to, the, the countries themselves were not necessarily able to take care of their own people. And so of course they'd rather come to the United States where they have, have an opportunity. So you've had this influx of folks coming over the border. So again, and right now it's kind of dicey even talking about any type of immigration reform in the Senate or with the House of Representatives, at least the House has already passed their bill, but it's one of those third rails of American politics, the issue of immigration reform, but it has to get done. We cannot wait another 35 years, but at the same time, we cannot take a bad bill either. So we're gonna to have to work with the Senate to make sure that we get a good one. Great. Um, to, to go along with that, one of our participants asks, what is the best way to advocate for ourselves regarding these matters? What are yes. some of the best practices that they can advocate? Well, uh, we actually, we do a boot camp at our Ag Labor Forum uh, in, uh, in uh, Las Vegas on advocacy. Uh, yeah, we, uh, uh, and we also do a little uh, uh, a smaller program in February here in DC, uh, but um, we're gonna be December 1st through the 3rd, we're gonna be in, in Vegas. Uh, and on the, on the 30th then of November, uh, uh, we will have an ag labor or advocacy boot camp. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you, so if you're interested, but a couple of things. One is, is make sure you're establishing relationships with your members of Congress, as well as your US senators. You're probably gonna be uh, most often gonna be talking with staff, but establish those relationships. And I'm gonna tell you one of the most important things to do in my experience with working with members of Congress is to get them out on the farm or the ranch. Let them actually see what goes on and the troubles you have trying to fill these jobs. Uh, and if you need data statistics or, or talking points on any of these issues, because you're gonna have a meeting, give us a call. We'll, we'll prepare them for you and we'll have them in your hands uh, so that you can advocate to, on, on behalf of your farm or your ranch because we have to have some change. And, and you guys and, and constituents are always, always the best folks uh, for, for members of Congress to talk to. Could you maybe go a step beyond that? Because a number of our participants that are on this evening are very active with their organizations that they're with and they have some of those relationships already established, mm -hmm. what's that next step besides that um, personal contact, personal relationship, getting them out of the farm? What, what can they take it one step further? Because they've been there and they're, they're ready to keep going on that next step. 
Yeah, it, 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 just keep doing it and do it, do it with, uh, uh, do it as repetitively as you can. Uh, that's, that's what makes things work here. Uh, you know, um, some, some people think, well, some people think money makes DC and the politicians move. That's yes and no. Uh, money gets you access. You know, if, you're, if you've got a political action committee, fund those, okay? But at the same time, you are the constituent. Those members of Congress work for you. They don't work for me. They work for you. And they need to pay attention to what their constituents are saying, or else you're going to give them a verdict at the ballot box they're not going to like. Uh, so be sure that you're, you're establishing those relationships. You expand them when you can. Uh, make contact with them so that they know who you are. Uh, as often as you can, when you get a chance, and, and uh, thankfully, uh, uh, you know, uh, we're, it looks like vac vaccines are, you know, getting even more broadly administered. Uh, folks are going to be getting back on planes again. Do that, and then and then come to D.C. and actually see if you can uh, get a chance to meet with the member or with their staff in, in their office. It makes a big impression. Actually, U.S. Custom Harvesters uh, every year comes to our annual meeting, and they do a great job when they get up uh, up to Capitol Hill, meeting with members and and explaining uh, exactly what's going on on the farm. Well, great. We've been together almost an hour and a half, and it's went really quickly, and we've learned a lot of great information tonight. Some really great presenters. So with that, thank you to our speakers. Russ, I'll go ahead and turn it back over to you. Thank you, Dana. And I wanna, again, thank everyone for joining this evening. A special thank you to all the presenters taking time out in the evening to do this. But we felt the evening was a great way to, to get our producers and custom harvesters online and, and get a good uh, feel of, or get a good crowd. So we had 40, over 41 stay with us throughout the evening. So that's great. Again, this will be recorded and Dana and I will put together a brief survey to send out along with that link to the recording. So again, thank all of you very much. If you have any questions, I put the contacts for everybody up there. Don't hesitate to reach out to myself, Dana, or anybody on the pre presenter list with any follow-up questions, we will make sure it gets to the right person and make sure that you get your question answered. So with that, I wanna thank everybody again. Have a great evening.